Welcome back. Good job on the midterm. Um, I, uh, I'll bring the graded midterms back to class on Wednesday. I meant to bring them today, so you can take them if you want them. Um, so today's lecture, we're going to look at some applications of the Fourier transform. And a great place to look for those is medical imaging, some nice examples. Uh, it, this won't be material that you're tested on or that you have to master. It's uh, meant to, to really sort of further bring to life what we've been learning. So enjoy it. Um, and uh, to begin with, um, so I have a few different uh, modalities of medical imaging I want to talk about. Can we name a few? Um, what, how is the body, so think of like a human body if you want to image the inside of the body. How is this done? MRI is one way. Yeah, that's the first thing I'll talk about. Uh, are there other ways? X-ray, OK. We've all had x-rays, I'm sure. We've been to the dentist, all right. Um, there's, a, there's another thing that you might think of like MRI, the, the CAT scan. OK, we'll talk about that. And um, OK, let's think of one other um, imaging technique. Yes? Um, we won't talk about PET scan. You, talked about, you said PET. Um, let's, what about another one? Uh, how about for, what did you say? Ultrasound. There you go. Ultrasound is used, um, for example, to see uh, babies in the mother's womb. OK. Um, so to begin with, let's just look at the uh, Wikipedia page for MRI. So as you know, MRI is magnetic resonance imaging. And um, the device looks something like this. Has anyone uh, had an MRI? You have. OK. So you had to, some part of your body had to go in here and probably sit there for a while. How long did it take? Wow. So, so it, that's, that's one of the. Uh, Traits of MRI, it's sort of slow. Okay. Um, of course, people are actively working on speeding up MRI, acquiring the image faster. But um, okay, so you you get you know inserted in here, whether it's your knee or your head or whatever part of your body that's being imaged. Um, what is this big thing here? What is it? It's a magnet. All right, it's an electromagnet. So they have some, usually some superconducting coil, and they have a lot of electricity going through, and they create a very strong magnet to put you in. You don't bring credit cards or pieces of metal into this room. Um, uh, in fact, I, a friend of mine does research on uh, MRI, and uh, so I've never had one done to me, but you know I've been in there and played with the MRI machine, and apparently you can take like um, aluminum and you can. You can do things with aluminum in the in the room because it's not going to get sucked onto the metal onto the magnet, and it's interesting to see what the uh, what forces are created as you try to tw move move the metal because it creates these jetty currents that uh, you know keep you from twisting it and stuff. It's it's a very strong magnet. Okay, so let's see how this. Oh, and the type of image you get from MRI, you get actually a three D representation of the object inside. Um, so here, let's look at their first example on this page, the, the head and brain. Now, if you, if you have a 3D representation, you still need to uh, present it in some way you know, to, the, to the human. So what's usually done is you take two-dimensional slices and present it in these two-dimensional slices. So this little video is going to just move through two-dimensional layers of the head from the MRI image that was obtained. OK, so there's just a, uh, again, that's a representation for our sake of a three-dimensional object by moving through it in two-dimensional slices. One, there's a, some interesting artifacts are shown here, which you'll understand more as we continue on in this course. Notice right in the middle, you get a wrap around. You get the nose and forehead wrapped to the wrong side. Let's see if you can notice it. When they cross out this side of the image, they end up over here. OK. There's actually a reason for that. It's, uh, it's aliasing, which we've mentioned here. Um, 
And uh, again, as we do sampling, which will be ne next lecture, hopefully that makes a lot more sense to you why something like that would happen. Okay. So um, I have some slides that I've borrowed from a few colleagues and friends. Um, these come from John Pauley at Stanford and uh, Neil Bangader at uh, Brigham Young University. Both of them do research in MRI. OK, so um, how the Fourier transform saved lives. So what's amazing is MRI is going to be so related to the Fourier transform. That's the fun part. Ooh, I realize I wanted to do one, th uh, one thing about the Fourier transform before we get into these slides. Let me get back out. OK, so I'm going to have to introduce first the two-dimensional Fourier transform. Let's, uh, let's do that. I've already mentioned that you can generalize what we've been doing to higher dimensions. So we'll do an example of that here. Suppose you have some signal, I'll call it S, and it has two variables. Usually our independent variable is t, but since I have two dimensions, I'm going to call it x and y. Oh, there you go. Thanks for telling me. The PowerPoint did something funny, and it made me on a separate screen here. OK. Thanks. All right. So we have this, uh, so suppose we have this signal that's, uh, I'll call it S of XY. OK, S is our signal, X and Y are the, the two coordinates. Well, we can define a two-dimensional Fourier transform in the following way. We can say capital S, which is what I use for Fourier transform, has now two variables. Uh, an x frequency and a y frequency. And we define this as a double integral. Just, just like we're used to, e to the negative i2 pi. But here what we have is a frequency in the x direction times x plus a frequency in the y direction times y. OK, and the inverse of this Fourier transform is what you probably expect. It's just this simple. You again do a double integral, but and you plug in the Fourier transform here. And you do a positive exponent, whoops, e to the i, 2 pi. And it's the same thing up here, fx, x plus fy, y, d, fx. D, F, Y. OK, so it's just the same formula. We just plug in two frequencies and two coordinates. And it works. Now, let's think about what is this. Um, uh, what does this actually mean? It means we're decomposing. Normally, we think of the Fourier transform as decomposing a signal into complex exponentials, which you can think of as sinusoid. right? Well, here we have a two-dimensional signal. We've got an x got a y, our signal is some, uh, you know, some function on this two-dimensional space. Think of it as a three-dimensional function. And um, what we're doing is we're now decomposing it into sinusoids of the following form. The sinusoid is defined by like a direction. Okay, and for a sinusoid in that direction, think of a plane wave. Okay, a plane wave is like this. Let's see, if, let's see if my drawing does it any justice. I have something like this. Oh. And uh, I'm going to put levels. These lines indicate where it's level. Okay, 
it's not a very perfect sinusoid, but you get the idea. So this is a plane wave. This is like a, a wave that's moving in, that's in one, one direction and flat in the other direction. Okay. So these sinusoids are what we're decomposing our signal into. Now, in reality, you can see from this integral that we're actually the, the signals here that we care about, again, they're complex exponentials. And I'm not able to plot a complex exponential in this plot for you. So I've, I've plotted it as a, as a real sinusoid. In reality, these plane waves are in this direction. You have a complex exponential. You, you know, I mean, I, I couldn't draw that without a four-dimensional plot because I would need a real and imaginary part. Okay? So I've only drawn it as a real sinusoid. And you, in your mind, you have to translate that to it's actually a complex exponential that's uh, developing in this direction. Okay, so in other words, these types of si uh, simple waves, we then decompose any signal. This two-dimensional Fourier transform is decomposing a signal into a sum or, or an integral of a bunch of these components. Okay, that's what it's doing. Now let me give you a second interpretation of what the two-dimensional Fourier transform does. First of all, notice that, um, first you should notice this. There's a more compact way to write this Fourier transform. That is, uh, we could write f as a vector of two parts, fx, fy. And we could write our position, our xy coordinates as a different vector. I'll use p just for position. Put x and y like this into a vector. Okay, that's our position in this space. And then what we have here is that um, this whole sum inside here is just f transpose p. Okay, so there's a more compact way to write. If we if we wrote f transpose p, this would look just like our normal Fourier transform. All right, it's just that we have vectors. Okay, another way to think about this Fourier transform is that um, if I rewrite the integral and I put, I'm just going to put a parenthesis around the inner integral. And I'm going to pull out part of the exponential function. Okay, so there's our integral. There's just a rewriting of this formula up here. So the Fourier transform is, in fact, the two-dimensional Fourier transform can be thought of as you first take this signal, this two-dimensional signal, and treat y, take, treat y as a constant. Okay, And take a Fourier transform of the signal across the x direction. So for any given y, this is just take your signal, which is some function on this space, take a slice of it for a constant y. That's a one-dimensional signal. And you take the Fourier transform of that. Okay, Do that for every y. So now it's like you've, you've replaced the x direction with frequencies, okay? because you've done a Fourier transform in the x direction. You've done it for every y. Then you, you turn and you take Fourier transforms up vertical direction. That's what this outer integral is. Okay, So it's just do a Fourier transform in one direction and then do it in the other direction. This generalizes to higher dimensions, too. Three dimensional is the same. Fourier transform in one dimension, another, another, and you get the three-dimensional Fourier transform. Okay. So let's go back to uh, these slides. <clears throat> OK, so the way that MRI works is, first of all, its advantages are that it's a, it's real, it's a non-invasive imaging modality. It, the, the radiation that's involved in MRI is not ionizing. In other words, it's not dangerous. You, you, unlike CAT scan, you don't want to have a CAT scan every day of your life because it's uh, hitting you with a bunch of x-rays. But MRI is actually not dangerous in that way. So that's, and also, it gives the, the ability to image different types of tissue. Okay. So what is it actually doing? Well. The way MRI works is it takes advantage of, uh, it, usually you're imaging hydrogen uh, atoms in, 
in the body. Now, you can image other things, but the typical thing, especially in the human body, is that you're imaging hydrogen. You're trying to say, see the concentration of the hydrogen, which is water, right? So you want to see where, where the water is concentrated. And that actually allows you to get some contrast. Why is that possible? It's because hydrogen has an unpaired proton in its nucleus. And that means, due to the spin, it has a magnetic moment. Okay? So it's like these little, you have these little uh, magnetic dipoles. Uh, they're all just randomly oriented in the, in the material. But if you put it in a magnetic field, then they align with the magnetic field. Okay? So the moment you get inside the MRI, all these hydrogens are aligning their magnetic moments. Okay. This happens very quickly. Um, I'm not sure the exact scaling, but I believe it's you know, microseconds or something that it's going to align. Okay, so, um, but something, there's something nice about what happens when it aligns. It actually, um, it actually doesn't immediately fall into alignment, okay? It does what you expect charges and, and uh, moving charges to do in a magnetic field. They actually rotate. Uh, if there was no loss, they'd just rotate forever. So it wouldn't actually line up. But because it's able to uh, lose energy, it does line up with the magnetic field. But as it's lining up, it first precesses around. So think of like a top spinning. Okay? If you spin a top, as it starts to slow down, the, it, it kind of does a wiggly thing like this. It precesses until it finally falls. Okay? Well, this is going to do the same thing, except it's not falling. It's actually getting into alignment. All right? It's falling towards alignment. But as it's falling, it's rotating around and at a specific frequency, and that's called the Larmor frequency, which is a function of the magnetic field and of the particular molecule. But in our case, we're just assuming everything's hydrogen. So it's a function, really, of just the magnetic field. In fact, it's, it's proportional to the magnetic field, the frequency is. Okay. So that's nice. So what's, what's cool about this is as it's rotating, as it's precessing, it actually is radiating electromagnetically at that frequency. In fact, as it's losing energy and falling into alignment, the energy loss is because it's radiating. Okay? So it's radiating outward, which means if you listen, for example, you have an antenna, you can hear it, it precessing around. Now, there's something uh, else you want to do with the antenna that this picture is showing. First of all, you get the body in the MRI. It all aligns. And now what do you do? Well, the first thing you want to do is you want, to, you want to knock it out of alignment and then listen to it as it goes back into alignment. Okay, so if you get a, a coil there, you can send out a little pulse that actually gets absorbed by these, these atoms and knocks them out of alignment with the magnetic field. And, is the, and then they're all going to want to return back. And as they return back, they're going to, they're going to radiate outward. I'm going to call this singing. So you're just listening to them singing back to you. All right. In fact, it's very much like having a guitar string and you know, hitting it with a puff of air, and it's gonna, you're going to be able to listen and hear it singing back to you until it stops. That's, that's basically what you're doing. You, you knock these things out of alignment with a little pulse. Not something, it's not like x-rays. It's not a really strong pulse. But it's enough that it knocks them out of alignment, and then you listen on, your, on the same coil. You listen to what you can absorb back to see whether, they're, whether they resonated. Okay. So there's a picture of you then receiving back uh, the radiation from it, rotating around. OK, so that's all nice. You know, like I said, you're in this strong magnetic field. They call that B, B naught. And uh, that, that causes this phenomenon. But notice that all we've said so far is that you can sort of sense that there is water, there are hydrogen atoms in that space. How do you sense it? Well, you put, the, you put the body in, you send out your pulse, and you listen for how loud you heard back the, uh, you know, the, the, the radiating, right? And that loudness should be proportional to how much there was in there, all right? Still, that's not giving you any ability to tell where the stuff is, right? We want to, we want to know where it is in this space. Where, you don't have like a directional listening device, all right? You're just listening to the whole sum of the material and how loud it is. So th here's where the real key is. You actually apply a, um, 
OK, so this is just a picture of what we've talked about. It's all in alignment. And then after the RF excitation, it gets out of alignment and starts precessing. And you're able, to, you're able to hear it. The key is this. You, don't, you, you add a gradient to the magnetic field. So you have this big electromagnet that's creating a very strong magnetic field. But you also have additional coils inside this MRI machine that allow you to apply a gradient, meaning you increase the magnetic field in one direction and decrease it in the other, just barely, barely compared to B naught. Okay. Um, what's this going to do? It's going to change the, the Larmor frequency. It's going to change the frequency that these things precess, depending on where they are. So now you should be able to use the frequency of the signal to help you determine where it is in the space, right? So things that are more up this direction, they're in a stronger magnetic field. Oh, you don't see that. Yeah. Things that are to the top are in a stronger magnetic field, and they're going to rotate faster. And you'll be able to hear that on your antenna. And things that are further this way rotate slower. Yes? Is it also very good on the wide so what, you're going to need to do something like that. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to tell along the y direction. So in fact, because it's not a one-dimensional thing, you actually have to do this several times. You have to do it very long y, very long x, and do some tricks. Great, great question. In fact, let's first talk about it as if it's one dimensional, just to make sure this intuition works. And then we'll make some comments about your question, about how you do the different directions. Because there's a z direction, too, so you actually want to do all three. OK, so let's, um, let's go back to the writing pad here. Oh, yeah. OK, so imagine that we just have a one-dimensional body. And we want to um, just understand how MRI would work in that case. OK, so first, let's draw the what you're trying to image okay we, suppose that the um, in this one dimension you have different density of material different density of hydrogen atoms and that's what we want to capture we want to know what is that density i mean so uh, here's a function that's meant to express the density okay so this is d of x or this is the x direction okay so it's the density of your object that's what we want to capture out of this image. So to do it, what we do is we, we apply a magnetic field that actually varies with x, right? So it's b naught plus some gradient, some constant g times x. That's the magnetic field. Which means that our signal here is going to be something like it's going to get a contribution from everything along in this space, so that'll be an integral <clears throat> of the density of x times <clears throat> the frequency with which it sings back to you. Right? That frequency, e to the i, 2 pi, some proportionality constant that depends on, remember I said the frequency depends on the magnetic field. right? So I'll just use gamma to, to say whatever that scaling is between magnetic field and frequency. And here's the magnetic field. So this is what you receive. Now, you might complain to me because why am I using complex exponentials as the received signal? Okay. In fact, you should be listening. You know, your, your antenna actually is capturing some real measurements, right? And <clears throat> you know, you're measuring the current on this antenna. These are all real numbers. How do I say that you're receiving a complex signal? Well, it turns out that the signal you're receiving has polarization, and you can actually use that to capture two different signals. And if you combine these two signals you capture, um, and, and you treat one as a real part and one as an imaginary part, okay, conveniently, the math all works out very nicely. This isn't the only case where that happens. So 
even though we said we usually, in real life, we have real signals, but there are often reasons to combine two signals and treat one as real and imaginary for the sake of the simplicity of the math. And this is one of those cases. So in a very, in a very real sense, they can grab, they can recover a signal that we, we will think of as a complex signal from this MRI antenna. Okay. So, um, okay, so this is what you receive, right? And what we want to get back is D of X. So first I'm going to just pull out some factors here. This is E to the I 2 pi gamma of T times this integral. All right, so how do we get dx back from this s of t that we captured? Uh, hopefully this equation looks somewhat familiar. Um, does anyone want to identify what this is? Okay, this integral is a Fourier transform. All right, so in other words, this I can write as, let's just leave this, this part out front. It's a simple signal. Um, this is, well, it's an inverse Fourier transform. Right? Okay. Because it's got, it doesn't have a negative sign. All right. So it's an inverse Fourier transform of D of X um, evaluated, though, not at, normally we would say evaluated at T, but this actually is evaluated at gamma G T. Okay. So you have to substitute, to, to really identify this as a or you transform, you have to clump those all into, whoops, clump these and this into, as your, you know, T variable. Okay. <clears throat> so then it's very simple to get back the actual uh, densities. Just take a, just undo this. Take a Fourier transform. I'm just going to undo everything. So you first multiply whatever your receive signal is, you multiply it by this complex function. You then, uh, oh well, you first do a little time scaling of it by, by gamma g. Then you multiply it by that complex exponential. Then you take a Fourier transform. Now these two steps, they look like clutter, and they really are just clutter. This time scaling and this multiplying, not fundamentally important to understanding what the, what the MRI is doing. If you skip these two steps and you just took your receive signal and just did a Fourier transform, you would actually get back this, this function. In other words, that's the image you're trying to get. You'd get it, but it would be time scaled and possibly shifted. Okay? So, I mean, you'd get the same image, but it, would just, it just needs a little bit of processing to interpret correctly. Right? So, really, MRI is exactly compatible with the Fourier transform. All you do from your received signal is take a Fourier transform to get your image. Pretty amazing. Okay. Now, this we described in one dimension. In reality, you need to be taking two dimensional, three dimensional samples here. So there's a, new, a different way of interpreting. Um, well, there's a, there's a more advanced way of acquiring the signal, which I'll get to in a minute. But I, I see I want to just one more time go through this exercise in different words just to make sure you kind of get the idea of how this is working. Um, so think of it as, think of each of these, uh, think of each of the um, atoms as a guitar string. Okay? And the magnetic field is the tension on the string that's going to determine the frequency. Right? So, What we have is, along our space, we've got a bunch of these points. You know, I'm going to draw them as delta functions. And there's so many of them that we think of it as a density. We're more interested in their density than the individual points, right? But let's say they're spaced out like this in some direction. OK. Now, by setting the magnetic field, we're able to effectively tune these strings. All right, and we're, what we're doing is we're tuning them so that the further they are in this direction, the higher the pitch is. 
And the further in this direction, the lower the pitch, right? So, um, so what you're basically doing is you're saying, if all you could do is close your eyes and listen, all right, to the sounds you're hearing, and you want to tell how many, you know, where these strings are in this location, it would be the, the pitch. You want to separate out the pitches, and that's going to tell you where they are. And of course, we know intuitively that the Fourier transform separates out the pitches. So if you just take a Fourier transform of what you're hearing, then you say, oh, I, I know I hear this much of a high frequency, this much of a low frequency, and those correspond to different, different points. Okay. So it's, it, that's, that's why the Fourier transform solves this problem. OK, I don't think I need to draw much there. Now, um, now, in reality, what they do, and I'll go back to the slides to, to show this, is they actually apply time-varying gradients. Because you don't, unlike the main magnetic field in the MRI, that one's fixed. You're not going to be able to change that on the fly. But the gradient, they can change very quickly. Okay? They can control it. So what you actually have are these time-varying gradients. Um, which the, so we'll say instead of a constant g, it's g of t. And so then what you're actually uh, receiving is the integral of all of the material. But the frequency is not fixed, so it becomes e to the i, 2 pi, gamma. And then, the, um, and then you have an integral up here of the magnetic field over time. Let's see. OK. So this is actually what you're receiving with a time varying gradient. Okay. Now, I won't go through all the implications of, of the math here. Um, there's one other thing that happens in reality, that S of t, this signal, is actually sampled in discrete time. And we haven't really gotten to the sampling lectures yet. But there are consequences of this being sampled. Um, OK. So let me just, I'm, I'm about to wrap up our discussion on MRI, but let me just give a, a brief comment on how the higher dimensions are done. So what's actually, um, what's actually occurring is uh, you have a gradient in each direction. So here they're showing a gradient in the other in the y direction, and in fact, the the way that they design MRI is through these charts where they say, "I'm going to apply a gradient." Um, so here's the the x, y, and the z gradients, and it's showing how strong they are as time progresses. Okay, and so they actually turn on one of the gradients for an amount of time, then they'll like turn it off, turn on another gradient, and they're taking samples the whole time. Okay, now it's hard right now without an extra lecture to show how you know how to interpret what you're what you're sampling here although wh the the way wh the way it turns out is you're actually sampling the higher dimension fourier transform um, in paths that are determined so this so this the way they talk about it in mri is this is case space it's just the two dimensional fourier transform of this image remember that in one dimension we said you sit there and capture a signal and that is and, and that is the Fourier transform of your image. Okay? Well, same thing in higher dimensions. What you're capturing are samples of the Fourier transform. But depending on how you turn on these gradients and what pattern, you actually end up taking paths through this Fourier transform space and taking samples. So this shows three different possible designs for an MRI system. Okay? So in this first one, it's saying it's going to go through, turn on gradients in such a way where the samples it takes are, are horizontal paths through the Fourier transform. Okay? So, it, so it does this once. That takes one sample through the Fourier transform. It waits a little bit, lets it die out. Does it again. Takes a new path through the Fourier transform. And then it pieces all these together. Now, someone in here said they've done an MRI before. Okay. Does it make noise? Does it do anything? 
What what kind? What does it do? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Because it well, it's constantly like re resampling, even to get this one image. You see, it had to had to do many different um, excitations, and then apply gradients in such a way where it can sample the Fourier transform. But once it has all these samples, here are other paths you could possibly take. You could turn on gradients in such a way where you're taking spiral paths or something. Once it has all these samples, then it does an inverse Fourier transform in higher dimensions. Okay. Um, and you get funny effects like if, you, um, if the samples you take are too spread out, then your image will wrap around on itself, just like we saw uh, in that example on Wikipedia. And again, like I said, this is due to aliasing. You'll, we'll see next time on our sampling lecture that if we take samples too far apart in time, then in frequency, they, copies get copied onto each other, which is exactly what's happening here. Okay. So, all right, that's enough for MRI. Let's talk a little bit about um, CAT scan. Okay. So CT, whoops, yep, I know. At least you guys will get to know my son's face pretty well. All right. Um, so CT stands for computed tomography. Just like MRI, this is also a 3D imaging technique, okay? Um, but in fact, it's, it's, in some ways it's easier to understand. Um, all it is is x-ray. So the way you're taking images with the CAT scan is by taking a bunch of x-rays. And x-rays are very easy to understand. But uh, this is a 3D imaging technique, and we'll see how do you get 3D out of x-rays. Okay, so x-rays are very easy to understand because they're just like shadows. Um, so, you know, think about, uh, as an example, think about um, bone, which is usually what you get contrast from in a, in a CAT scan or in an X-ray. It's more absorbent of X-rays than, um, than the rest of your material, okay? So, here's a... There's a bone, <laughs> very bad one. Okay, and um, suppose you shine x-rays down on it, like this. All right, and you have a film on the other side of it, and that film absorbs x-rays, although, as you can tell, it's gonna absorb less where the bone is, right? So here's a graph of how much uh, x-rays it absorbed. It's gonna absorb a bunch, gets to the bone, and starts absorbing less and then absorbs more once it's, the bone's not there, right? Okay, so this is what your film looks like. Now, we can write out an equation for what you actually have captured on your film, okay? We have our two-dimensional, um, so let's say this is uh, M1 of X. It's the first X-ray you take in the vertical direction, okay? And it's gonna be the intensity of the, uh, the X-ray on the film. All right. So this is going to be some background intensity. The intensity you would get if you had no bone there. I'll call that I naught. And it's going to be minus some absorption that happened because of the bone. Now, I'm going to oversimplify for the moment and say this is just an integral of some function d of x, y that's some absorption coefficient for your material. And it's integrated in the y direction. So uh, I won't put the limits of the integral, but basically it's an integral over this space of how much absorption there is at each point. Now, to get the physics correct, um, an integral here is not quite accurate. It should be um, a mul multiplicative factor as it gets absorbed. But all you have to do is take logs, and multiplication becomes addition. So if we first take logs of our intensities and everything, then this is actually quite accurate, that you have some integral of how much is absorbed in that direction. So this is saying for each fixed x, you integrate vertically here the uh, density, or the, uh, the absorption coefficient. And that's going to say how much less intensity you have on the film there. Right? So of course, you can just undo this. You were interested in this thing right here. 
So I'm going to pretend that this is what you capture. Of course, you just take your x-ray film. You just subtract it from the background intensity. You, you have now this integral. OK. So um, now, then you would go and do it in another direction. And, uh, you know, and you'd get a, a second uh, image. So, what ca so I want to interpret this in a way that I showed you you can interpret these integrals in one of our last lectures. And that is that you can think of this as an integral. I can put a dxy e to the negative i 2 pi 0 dy. So in other words, what I'm saying is if you integrate in a certain direction, you can think of that as the Fourier transform at a zero frequency. Right? Why would you want to do that? Because the, the way CAT scan works is you take images in all sorts of directions. So you take another one this way. And you know, here I'm going to draw the plot of the intensity there. It'll look very similar for my bone. Yeah, for this bone, it'll go like drop off where the bone is. OK, so we'll call this M2 of Y. All right, so we have a, you get a bunch of these images at all sorts of angles. And then you have to try to reconstruct the three-dimensional space. Now, the, the algorithm for actually doing that is different than I'm going to show you right here. What I'm going to show you is just a, um, conceptually how such a thing can work and how you can understand that it works through the Fourier transform. The algorithms actually, you have iterative algorithms that are quite simple for filling in the three-dimensional space based on all of these different projections. Okay? Um, but think about the following. If each of these projections can be interpreted, I'll interpret these, these integrals as a Fourier transform with zero frequency, then um, consider this, that if I take the Fourier transform of what I receive. All right. I'm going to call this, yeah. OK, so if I take the Fourier transform of this guy, of course, really, I want to preprocess it and get rid of that I0 out of there. So this Fourier transform. And look at what that becomes. As we saw before, this, be, this is now a two-dimensional Fourier transform. I'll take out the i part. I've got some i naught delta function. Just ignore that. Because like I said, you should really just pre-process that out of it. And the negative sign you can ignore. But we have a double integral now of dxy e to the negative i 2 pi. And here we have a 0 in the y direction plus an fxx dx dy. So I can interpret this as this is the two-dimensional Fourier transform of d, what we're trying to image, except it's only evaluated at frequencies fx and 0. Okay, So I have my d of x, y, which I want to image. It has a Fourier transform, a two-dimensional or, th or three-dimensional Fourier transform. And so this is fx, this is fy. And what I'm saying is that my first projection, my downward image, if I take the Fourier transform of that, it's, exam it's exactly a sample of the two-dimensional Fourier transform along this line. So I've sampled it along that line. Okay. If I then take the second image, let's say the sideways one, and I take a Fourier transform of the film, okay, that is exactly going to be a sampling along the, uh, the vertical direction of the two-dimensional Fourier transform. And as I continue to take other directions, I'm getting samples of the Fourier transform along some slice through the origin. So I'll get like a slice here. I'll get a sample of the Fourier transform there if I went at that angle with my x-ray. So if I fill these in with enough x-rays, I start to recover the Fourier transform. All right. Of course, you need some way of interpolating. You can't have infinite number of x-rays, so you're going to have to interpolate between. And you use things like the volume of your object and so forth 
to do that smoothing, all right, to figure out when you have enough samples. And, uh, and then once you have enough, you do an inverse Fourier transform. So that's conceptually how you could recover. Like I said, the algorithm for doing it doesn't actually go through this process. In, in MRI, the first thing we talked about, you actually do use a Fourier transform. Here, the, the, the machine's not actually using a Fourier transform. OK, last thing was uh, I wanted to mention uh, ultrasound, just very briefly. So ultrasound uses sound waves, like it sounds. Um, but it's very much like, uh, like radar. So understanding ultrasound and understanding radar are basically the same. Okay. So both of these involve sending a signal out and looking at its reflection off of objects. Okay. And that reflection in the body is going to come from different densities of material. When the density changes, you get some reflections. Okay. So, um, so just imagine, let's just talk about radar for a minute. You have some, some antenna that transmits some signal. Okay. And it goes out and bounces off something like a car. Okay. So the signal comes, bounces off, and you receive it back on your antenna. And that's it's very simple to understand how radar works. Now, it's not going to just bounce off the object you're interested in. It's also going to bounce off other things. Say there's some building back here. It's going to also bounce off this. And you're going to receive both of these. Um, but you can use all sorts of information about the received signal to determine what, what you hit. For example, um, the time it took is going to tell you how far away the objects are. So it should take longer to hit this, the building than the car here. right? Also, you can use the Doppler shift of the signal you, you receive to determine the speed of the object that you hit. Right? So if the car was moving, it's going to change the frequency of the reflected signal. All right, so you can determine things like speed. Um, now, what you usually do, you send out a pulse signal, not a continuous signal. So a pulse signal, that way you can measure these things, like the timing. So you send out something. Here, let me just make up a pulse. Looks like you know, something. Let's say it looks like that. Um, and then you listen. And you want, you're going to want to identify when that pulse got back to you. So let me just mention one thing that relates to what we've learned so far. Um, the received signal, like we said, it could bounce off multiple objects. It's also going to have a lot of noise. All right? So it's not going to be just completely obvious when this pulse was returned to you. But there's a method that is uh, the optimal method for detecting uh, when these things occur. Or, well, it's the optimal method for, determining, for distinguishing between, between signals. And it's known as the matched filter. And um, this, uh, and it's, it's fun because it's actually an LTI system. So what you do here is you implement a convolution. You implement a filter. Uh, we'll call it a filter. Um, that has an impulse response, H of t, which is exactly your pulse signal conjugated and time reversed. Okay, so you implement a system that has this impulse response. So what's going to happen? You have some received signal. This is attached to your antenna, right? You're listening to the reflected signal. It gets fed in here. It's really ugly and noisy. And you want to say, oh, when did those pulses happen? Well, on the output of this filter, you're going to get certain peaks. And, you're going to, and then you, 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 you decide that those peaks, the peak location, is the, uh, is the occurrence of your pulse. Okay. So the peak locates S of t. Now, think about for a minute, we, we introduced, there was one lecture where we talked about convolving with S conjugate of negative t. Does anyone remember? Um, it wasn't a big point of emphasis. It was, I think, the last lecture before the midterm. We said, if you take S of t and convolve it with S conjugate of negative t, in signal processing, that's referred to as the autocorrelation function. Okay. So assuming there was no noise and no multipath, you just put S of t into this match filter. What comes out is exactly the autocorrelation function. But I pointed out one thing about the autocorrelation function. What is 
the autocorrelation function at time zero. It's the energy of your signal. Okay, you can just see that from the integral. So what that means is the more energy in your pulse here, that's going to determine the height of this peak that comes out of the mesh filter. Okay, so in a, you're basically converting energy in your pulse signal to ability to identify it in the output of the mesh filter. So it'll be higher if it's a higher energy signal. So people design signals so that their autocorrelation function is very nice and peaky, and you don't have a lot of uh, cause to uh, misdetect at other times. All right. So, okay, that's it for today. Oh, by the way, we have a problem set due this week. It's unusual because we're staggering it with the labs, and the labs will be due next week. So please get started. It's due Friday. You already can do most of what's on there. Some of the, the sampling problem you won't be able to do until after Wednesday, unless you just read ahead in the book. But.